Uh, well, since uh, David brought up Orwell, I might mention that uh, in his defense that he didn't only write about thought control in totalitarian societies. It's perfectly true that that was the you know, well, thrust, main thrust of his work, and it's certainly what he's known for. Uh, but he did write an interesting essay called uh, Literary Censorship in England, and it was about uh, thought control in free societies. Picked England as the example because he was there. And the point that he made is that it really wasn't all that different from the totalitarian Soviet Union. It was just done in different ways. Uh, but he said that, the, in fact, one of the ways he mentioned is a good education. You'll be happy to know. So if you have a good education, I presume he meant, you know, Oxford and Cambridge and those places, uh, you just have it instilled in you that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say uh, or even to think if the system's working properly. Uh, and he also talked about private ownership of the press and other factors that, as he puts it, uh, end up um, with an, the result that unpopular ideas are, uh, uh, and in what he called inconvenient facts, uh, are silenced with uh, surprising effectiveness. Well, that's not very well known, and there's a reason for it. Um, it was intended as the introduction to his famous animal farm, which made him a household word, you know, satire on the Soviet Union. Uh, but as if to prove his point, uh, it was uh, silenced with uh, surprising effectiveness. It didn't appear for unknown reasons, which his biographers don't go into, though they must know. Uh, and it was discovered about 25 years later, long after his death, in his unpublished papers. So it's true that uh, Orwell is known for his attack on the other guy, uh, but uh, he uh, generalized the point. And the more important points, the ones that have to do with us, which are always the most important, uh, those uh, have been, as he put it, kept dark and silenced with surprising effectiveness. Still unknown for the most part, except the real Orwell aficionados. Uh, well, that message is worth bearing in mind. He was writing about England, but applies to us as well, and more importantly, because of American power. Uh, it was American power, in fact, that established the current world order. Uh, there are only occasional moments in human affairs when uh, you can sensibly, when there are changes that are dramatic and significant enough so that it makes sense to talk about um, a world order. One of them, uh, probably the most dramatic and the most easily timed, surely, was uh, in 1945 at the end of the uh, most devastating single catastrophe in human history, which left much of the industrial world either seriously damaged or in ruins, uh, except for the United States, which was unscathed and, in fact, had benefited enormously from the war. Industrial production more than tripled. Uh, that uh, ended the Depression, which had not been affected very much by the New Deal, uh, and it set the stage for the next phase of history. The United States at that time had about half the world's total wealth and unparalleled military power and uh, security of, uh, at a level that had no precedent, and perfectly naturally dominant forces in the state corporate system uh, plan to use that power to uh, organize the world in accord with their own perceived self-interest. That's what's technically called the national interest uh, in uh, academic writing and the media and so on. Uh, and so these truisms, which is what uh, kind of a curiosity about the intellectual culture, is that these truisms, which is what they are, are commonly described as a Marxist view, which is kind of odd since the first person I ever, who I know of who articulated them clearly was Adam Smith, uh, and perhaps the person who most lucidly articulated them was Winston Churchill. Uh, and uh, you know, it shouldn't strain the intelligence of an eight-year-old to figure out that that's the way the world works. Uh, anyway, it does. If you have a good education, that's an inconvenient fact, but uh, it's a fact. Uh, well, uh, how do you organize the world? Uh, the, uh, uh, there were conflicting visions. The United U.S. elites had their picture of how it ought to be organized, but it was certainly not uh, 
uniform by any means, and opposing forces had to be uh, dealt with somehow. You want to borrow some Cold War rhetoric, they had to be contained or possibly rolled back if that could be done. Uh, and that was done with varying degrees of success. Uh, the basic conflicts, of course, persist, and they persist for quite simple reasons. They're about the fundamental values, about uh, justice and freedom and human rights. Uh, and and uh, these values are constantly an arena of conflict between uh, the more powerful, between centers of power and most of the rest. That's a good deal of history, and the last half century is no exception to that. Well, at the onset of the current era, at the end of the Second World War, uh, there were uh, very, uh, uh, the, the framers of the New World Order, uh, they had to face these challenges uh, everywhere. Uh, first, they had to face them at home. I mean, domestically, in the United States, what had to be contained or rolled back was the fact that a large majority of the population had rather strong commitments to um, more or less social democratic ideals, sometimes a lot more far-reaching than that, uh, positions that the business world quite rightly uh, regarded as a threat to its traditional domination of U.S. society. Uh, as they put it in their own internal publications, it was the hazard-facing industrialists in the rising political power of the masses, uh, which had to be contained and suppressed. Uh, uh, that, was, uh, it, uh, that was then, uh, you, that's a constant theme that runs through, came up again uh, in the wake of the uh, uh, turmoil of the 1960s, uh, which uh, led to uh, concerns among elites, in this case liberal elites, uh, about what they called the crisis of democracy, the fact that large parts of the population that are usually apathetic and passive and obedient were trying to enter the political arena to press their own demands. It's a crisis of democracy which had to be overcome. Uh, they incidentally expressed particular concern about what they called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, uh, the ones who make sure that you don't have, uh, that the wrong thoughts don't come to mind. Uh, and the period since the early 1970s has been one of um, a doctrinal assault uh, against the effort, the rather successful in many ways, uh, liberatory elements of the 1960s. That's the modern period. But going back to uh, uh, the early period, the early mid-1940s, these were major problems. Uh, and it's interesting to look at how they were dealt with, but can't go into it now. Uh, well, there were similar problems right throughout the industrial world. Uh, there they were enhanced by the fact that the anti-fascist resistance uh, had uh, quite considerable prestige and appeal at the end of the war. And often it had a sort of radical democratic thrust to it. Uh, also, traditional conservative the traditional conservative order had been discredited because of its association with fascism. Well, the first, first task of the United States and Britain uh, after the war was to restore that traditional order in its essentials. Uh, and that was a major, it was done all over the world in one or another form, sometimes bloodily, sometimes in other ways, mostly in ugly ways. Uh, that should be chapter one of post-Second World War history. Well, as in the United States, that project continues. It's taken new forms in the last couple of decades uh, under, you know, under the guise of what's sometimes called neoliberalism or uh, uh, economic rationalism or uh, the free market and other terms that are permeated with a good deal of fraud and hypocrisy. I'll come back to that. Uh, in the third world, there were similar problems in the 40s. Uh, and there they were compounded by pressures to uh, dismantle the imperial systems and the legacy that they had left, the legacy of subordination and dependency. Uh, and throughout the third world, rather similar policies were imposed, but you can really see them in their starkest clarity in Latin America. And the reason is because there the United States really reigned supreme. I mean, there were essentially no challenges. So you can see the policies formulated, you read them in internal documents, sometimes public ones, 
and executed with uh, pretty dramatic clarity. Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, there, uh, when I say there were no challenges, that's not quite true. Uh, there was one major challenge, and that was the domestic population uh, in Latin America. Uh, there, uh, there was a threat, and it was recognized right away. Uh, the State Department records from the mid-40s, uh, early and mid-40s, talk about the concern, their concern with what they called the philosophy of new nationalism that was sweeping all over Latin America. <coughs> I'm now quoting, uh, it was embracing policies designed to bring about a broader distribution of wealth and to raise the standard of living of the masses on the principle that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country. Uh, the name for that evil doctrine is uh, radical nationalism or economic nationalism. Uh, uh, that's what's called an official state papers. And of course, it's unacceptable. Uh, the first beneficiaries of a country's resources uh, should be uh, U.S. investors, their counterparts elsewhere, and the local associates. That's taken for granted. Uh, we have to protect our resources, as the chair of the uh, State Department's policy planning staff put it, uh, George Kennan, famous humanist. Our resources happen to be somewhere else, but they're ours, and we have to protect them and make sure that we're the first beneficiaries. Uh, there was a conflict over this, and in February 1945, at a hemispheric conference, a U.S. power naturally prevailed, and the United States imposed what was called the Economic Charter of the Americas, which called for an end to economic nationalism in all its forms, so none of this nonsense. Uh, well, there followed a cruel and bloody half-century still going on, uh, and these were central themes throughout, and they remain so. Uh, they're very much alive today, <clears throat> although here, too, uh, they take the form of, uh, they've changed somewhat in style and form. Now they're in the framework of a certain kind of globalization in a very special form, uh, which is crafted primarily to serve the interests of those with power perfectly, naturally, transnational corporations, financial institutions, the state elites, and so on. Well, the most critical part of the third world uh, then and now as well was the Middle East. And there's a simple reason for that. It was the locus of the world's major energy supplies and remained so. Uh, state Department didn't mince words about it. It was uh, called uh, the greatest material prize in world history. Uh, and uh, the strategically most important part of the world, a stupendous source of strategic power and so on. That's the Middle East. And it was clear uh, who had to be the uh, first beneficiaries of those resources. Uh, they had to be under effective U.S. control. Uh, they had to be accessible on terms that are acceptable to U.S. power, U.S. leadership. And the main concern was the huge profits that they generate now, they had to flow primarily to the United States, uh, secondarily to its uh, junior partner, as the British Foreign Office uh, ruefully described itself uh, in uh, the mid-1945 internal documents recently released. Uh, the profits have to be recycled by local managers. Um, who are supposed to be de dependent on the global rulers. Uh, the British in their day in the sun had a nice name for them in internal documents. They called them the Arab facade, behind which the British would exercise actual rule. They're still around. They're still the Arab facade. So that's the structure, um, basic structure of the system. Naturally, it uh, engenders continual conflict. The people of the region don't understand uh, why they shouldn't be the beneficiaries of the resources of that region, kind of backward that way, uh, they, and that causes problems. Uh, in internal documents, the problems which have been going on since the Second World War, and in fact long before, uh, they are called uh, the problem of radical nationalism, economic nationalism, and so on. For the general public, for people like us, they're different terms used for them. They're called international terrorism, of 
you're really a big intellectual, uh, the crisis, the clash of civilizations, or some other fancy term. But it's good old-fashioned radical nationalism, the strange idea that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country, and that there should be efforts to, to construct policies uh, designed to bring about a broader distribution of wealth and to raise the standard of living of the masses in State Department terminology. Uh, well, that goes on, and it's likely that it'll become worse, at least if the consensus of geologists is anywhere near accurate. Uh, that is that uh, uh, the uh, current oil glut and extremely low prices, I mean, at the pump in the United States, they're lower than they've been since the Second World War uh, in real terms. It's generally assumed that that's a temporary phenomenon. Uh, and that uh, there is a, uh, uh, an oil shortage coming, probably not too far. Uh, the reason for that belief is that the rate of discovery uh, has declined, which went up from about 1850 until the mid-1960s, kept, kept going up. It's been declining since the mid-60s, despite much more elaborate technology and deep drilling and so on, keeps going down. Uh, and uh, the available oil, which is some rough estimate of it, uh, is uh, being used up very fast. In fact, close to half of the known exploitable capacity has been used since the oil crisis of the early 70s, and it's accelerating. Uh, so that, you know, you just put um, about, uh, furthermore, about half of the known exploitable capacities in the Middle East, uh, which means that that region of the world uh, will become you know, it'll be looming larger and larger uh, in the effort to control the whole world. Uh, uh, and uh, those are, you know, not certain but reasonable prospects, unless there's something radically new discovered that looks as if that's what's coming. There's a general prediction that about half of total known capacity will have been used up by within a decade or maybe two decades, anyway, not very distant future. And after that, as far as anybody knows, there'll be a decline and a shift to Middle East sources as the major center. Now, there's a lot of hype about the Caspian Sea and so on, but that's apparently mostly fake, according to oil uh, company sources. They claim it's being hyped by the United States government for political reasons as part of their, anti, their, their effort to uh, develop an alliance with Europe against Iran, which they so far haven't been able to do. So they're kind of talking about Caspian Sea, but the estimates are that that's maybe on the order of uh, North Sea oil, not very large. A couple of years' use at most. Uh, the, and, uh, and most of it isn't in that region, it's in Kazakhstan. Uh, well, anyhow, those are prospects that are expected, which means the Middle East will be, be a major center of conflict and turmoil, very probably. There are new alignments taking shape there, which if you want to, you should keep your eyes on them. Uh, it's not yet, in, part of it's already uh, there, part of it's taking shape, a kind of an alignment between, uh, which is, this one's very visible, uh, Turkey, Israel, and the Palestinian administration, which is supposed to keep the Palestinians under control. They're supposed to play the role, basically, that the black leadership of the Bantustans played in, uh, under the apartheid regime. That's what the Y agreement was about. Uh, so those three are sort of on one side. The Turkey-Israel relation is now very visible and frightening people. On the other side, you can see a kind of a, and this must be worrying people in the State Department, no end in the planning centers. There's the beginnings of uh, interactions, rapprochement between Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, uh, Syria, in part frightened by the Turkey-Israel relationship that's being established under U.S. power with the junior partner following loyally behind, as always. Uh, and it's, this is a recipe for a lot of trouble in the future. Uh, well, there's a lot to say about all these matters, but uh, and plenty of aspects of the post-war, post-World War II world and global system that I haven't even mentioned. But let's drop that, I'll, if you're interested, be glad to talk about it later, and turn to something different, uh, namely the institutional framework that was designed for world order in the, in the mid-40s. Uh, 
that's 50 years ago, uh, asked how it's fared and uh, where it stands today. Uh, that institutional framework had three basic pillars. Uh, there was an international political order, there was a human rights order, and an economic order. The political order is uh, articulated in the United Nations Charter. Uh, the, uh, let me say a little about each. The first, the political order, that's essentially the UN Charter. Uh, the uh, Charter has some simple, a uh, long document, but it has, it's based on a very simple principle, namely it bars the threat or use of force uh, in international affairs, threat or use of force. Uh, and there are only two exceptions to that, which are clearly specified and more or less irrelevant to the real world. Uh, one is uh, if the Security Council of the United Nations uh, unanimously authorizes the use of force or the threat of force uh, after having determined that peaceful means uh, have failed. The second exception uh, is famous Article 51, which permits uh, self-defense against armed attack uh, until the Security Council acts. Armed attack's pretty narrowly defined concept in international law. That means a sudden, overwhelming attack. So, for example, if uh, Cuba were to land troops in Washington, uh, the way the United States is supposed to respond uh, is to inform the Security Council and ask them to do something about it. Uh, and until the Security Council acts, the United States is permitted to use force and self-defense against the Cuban invasion. Uh, that example may be hypothetical, I'm not sure. The Cuban th a couple of months ago, the Cuban threat was officially downgraded by the Pentagon. Uh, that elicited a lot of anger on Capitol Hill and there was rejected by the White House. Uh, at the same time, the European Union was uh, uh, bringing charges against the United States and the World Trade Organization, U.S. embargo against Cuba for violating international law, as has already been determined by every relevant international body. And the U.S. refused to accept World Trade Organization jurisdiction, claiming a national security exception, uh, meaning that the Cuban threat is still live. So you better make sure you got your gas masks handy and your desks to hide under and so on. Well, anyway, that's the sole exception. These are the sole exceptions. There's, of course, no enforcement mechanism uh, apart from the great powers, and decisively that means the United States. But uh, the problem is that the great powers, uh, as far as I know, universally reject the principles of the Charter, and the small powers would too if they were big enough to get away with it. Uh, they reject them in practice and uh, also in the case of the United States explicitly in doctrine as well, very clearly so in fact. Uh, the doctrine has been stated repeatedly, uh, maybe stated most clearly by uh, Dean Acheson, leading statesman at the time. He was a senior advisor to the Kennedy administration. Uh, he was justifying the plainly illegal blockade of Cuba in 1962 before a meeting of the American Society of International Law. And he pointed out, he stated that, uh, uh, a, I'm quoting him, a situation in which uh, our country's power, position, and prestige are involved cannot be treated as a legal issue. Okay, so if U.S. power, position, and prestige are involved, forget about international law. Uh, the Charter or anything else. That's pretty plain uh, and accurate. Uh, there's no need and no time uh, to uh, go through the practice of the past half century. Uh, one recent example is the bombing of the uh, pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. It's quite trivial in historical context, though of course a war crime. Uh, and didn't arouse much concern here, but I suppose that if there was a terrorist attack that had destroyed uh, half of U.S. pharmaceutical supplies, I might have maybe made it to the back pages of the newspapers. Uh, anyhow, that's a minor example of, um, the, in that case, the use of force in radical violation of international law with hardly even a plea to, of any cover, but it's quite standard. Uh, you read it in the front pages every time there's any talk about, say, bombing Iraq. Uh, obviously, that's not done with Security Council support. 
Uh, the U.S., of course, knows it can't get the Security Council to agree to that. So therefore, it's just blatant violation of the central principles of international law, even the threat. This is independent of what you may happen to think about the regime or anything else. We're talking here about the international political order. Uh, what's kind of interesting about the past 15 years or so, the, since Reagan, uh, is that uh, it's all become very open and public. Uh, so that's the one real innovation of the recent period. So the United States, during the Reagan administration, uh, claimed officially that Article 51, self-defense against armed attack, uh, that that includes, I'm quoting, self-defense against future attack. That was, that, was, that was a justification for the bombing of Libya. Or it permits the United States, quoting, to defend its interests. That was the justification for the invasion of Panama. Uh, the, uh, it's even gotten more ludicrous in the uh, Clinton years. Uh, but uh, the basic point is we'll do what we feel like. Uh, and now that's open and unchallenged, uh, accepted by the intellectual community, except maybe they question it on pragmatic grounds. Uh, so that's the end of the UN Charter. That's the end, official end. Uh, it's always, it's never been effective, uh, but uh, it's by now officially dead uh, about the practice. It's, I should, don't, won't go into it, but the, this has been amply demonstrated in action in uh, shocking ways, and again, always with the acquiescence uh, and the, uh, just the support of the intellectual classes, the educated classes, those who got a good education uh, and know which things are inconvenient facts. So there are no such facts as, say, the American invasion of South Vietnam in the early 1960s or the uh, U.S. war uh, against the church and other uh, miscreants in uh, Central America in the 1980s and uh, on and on. Those didn't happen in official history uh, or of course, they happened in real history. Uh, in a free society, in a free institution of higher learning, these would be central components of the curriculum. And in fact, it's a kind of a reasonable measure of the freedom of the university to ask exactly how much attention is given to these central events of modern history and the doctrine that uh, lies behind them. I believe that is an exercise for those who might be interested. We know what the answer is going to be. Well. Let's turn to the second pillar of world order, the uh, human rights regime. That's, of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, in a couple of days, on December 10th, that'll be the 50th anniversary of its uh, signing, unanimous signing. And we'll probably be regaled with uh, condemnations of the horrendous uh, human rights violations of somebody else. Uh, particularly official enemies, and those charges will probably be accurate or reasonably accurate, but partial. Uh, you can be pretty confident that the inconvenient facts won't be mentioned. Uh, a vastly more important topic uh, will be ignored, namely human rights violations and often terrible atrocities, uh, which can be charged in whole or in part to our account easy to think of examples, many of them ongoing. Well, these are, whatever their scale, their scale happens to be huge, but even if their scale was slight, they would be far more important than enemy atrocities or other atrocities for quite elementary moral reasons, uh, moral truisms. Namely, these are the cases that we can act to mitigate or to terminate. So on the most elementary principles, those are the most important. Uh, the comparative treatment of enemy atrocities in our own is very instructive. Uh, and again, I'll put it aside. There's plenty in print about it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know of any analysis of Stalinist propaganda. But I assume it was sort of a mirror image of ours. Uh, it'd be interesting to discover that. In fact, it'd be interesting to discover if it sinks to the depths of moral cowardice uh, of our treatment of Western treatment, American treatment of the atrocities chargeable home. That's another good topic for somebody to look at. Uh, if you want, you can get a certain insight into the real understanding of human rights uh, by looking at a doctrine that's well known to international lawyers, but not much beyond. It's called the Hull Formula. Uh, 
It's attributed to U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull of the Roosevelt administration. Uh, this formula defines what it calls the international minimum standard of civilization. Uh, well, that standard doesn't involve genocide or torture and other such marginal issues. Uh, rather, uh, it is, I'm quoting, the right to adequate, effective, and prompt compensation for expropriated property where full compensation is to be at fair market value as determined by the former owners. Uh, that's the international minimum standard of civilization. Uh, and it's a formula that applies in rather intricate ways. Uh, for example, it's the basis for the U.S. economic embargo and terrorist war against Cuba for 40 years. Uh, that's been carried out because of Cuba's failure to meet this minimum standard of civilization. That is, it failed to offer what Washington unilaterally decided was fair compensation for nationalized property. So the formula applies there. On the other hand, it doesn't apply for some odd reason to U.S. investors and the U.S. government who stole the Cuban properties at the turn of the century uh, when Cuba was under U.S. military occupation and consented to this robbery by force. Uh, but that expropriation was okay. It doesn't fall under this principle. Uh, the principle also doesn't hold for uh, the U.S. government and private powers who stole Spanish and British possessions in Cuba and the Philippines at the same time. Uh, after the bloody conquest of the Philippines, which killed a couple hundred thousand people, uh, the United States uh, threw out the Spanish concession for the, for example, for the Spanish-owned Manila Railway Company on the grounds that, I'm quoting, it had been inspired by Spanish imperialistic motives, say, unlike the uh, U.S. possessions that Cuba nationalized. Uh, so it's a rather subtle doctrine. Uh, it also doesn't apply to the founding of the United States. Uh, that was based on expropriation of British properties, British possessions, and also the possessions of British supporters, who were about as numerous as the rebels in the Civil War uh, that was part of the global war going on at the time. Uh, it's called here the American Revolution. Uh, actually a civil war with two sides supported by different great powers and more or less equally balanced at home. Uh, New York State alone gained close to four million dollars, which was a huge sum in those days by taking the property of loyalists. But that's okay, that doesn't fall under the formula. Well, it goes on, you have to have a kind of subtle mind and good education to comprehend all of this and to understand what counts as an international minimum standard of civilization. Uh, and against that kind of background, you can understand more accurately the significance of the Universal Declaration uh, in the real world. Actually, one final comment on that and then I'll go on. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the, the central thesis of it is universality, of course. That means all of the rights enumerated are of equal status. And you're pretty sure to hear talk in the next uh, couple of days about, you know, the relativists, various bad guys, uh, plead Asian values and things like that. Again, the charges will be mostly accurate, again, partial. Uh, you're unlikely to read editorials about the fact that the United States is a leader of the relativist camp, quite officially. Uh, one whole category of rights enumerated in the Universal Declaration is simply dismissed, uh, namely the socioeconomic provisions. Uh, according to the U.S. government, they have no status. Uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick, Reagan's ambassador to the U.N., uh, she described them as a letter to Santa Claus. Uh, the uh, U.S. ambassador, Morris Abram, the ambassador to the U.N. Commission on Human Rights, described them as preposterous, a, a dangerous incitement. Actually, he was talking about the Declaration of the Right to Development that the UN was considering, which closely paraphrases the Universal Declaration, and which the US proceeded to veto, uh, thereby vetoing central parts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, maybe I'll be surprised, and there'll be an editorial about this, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, again, there's a lot more to say. If you read those provisions, you'll see why they have no status. Uh, so let's put that aside and turn to the international economic order, which is actually all over the front pages today. Uh, the reason that it's all over the front pages is that the crisis of the last 20 or 25 years 
uh, has finally become, begun to hit rich people. So now it's a crisis. Uh, up until now, it didn't exist. Uh, but now you can read it in the headlines. Uh, and by now, what's been happening is reasonably well known uh, for exactly that reason. Nothing new, just different victims or potential victims. Uh, the International Economics Order was also established in the mid-40s, 1944. It's the Bretton Woods system. Uh, 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 it's uh, uh, the Bretton Woods system designed by the United States and England uh, was essentially, I mean, theoretically not, but effectively then. Uh, it had two uh, basic principles. Uh, one principle was that it called for freeing up trade, so liberalizing trade. They wanted to get back to something like the period before World War I, uh, which we're only just about approaching in terms of scale of international economic transactions relative to the economy and so on. Scale, it's not all that novel. Uh, so they wanted, and during, between the two wars, it had declined a lot. So they wanted to liberalize trade. It's principle one. Uh, the second principle was to regulate uh, capital flow, keep exchange rates fixed. Uh, that's actually still, you can still find that in the IMF rules. Uh, the reason for the second principle was in part uh, a belief, which is probably, probably correct, at least reasonable, that uh, capital flight, um, short-term speculative capital flows, particularly and exchange rate fluctuations, which go along with them, uh, they're going to undermine trade. Uh, trade and, and investment. And in fact, recent experience tends to be consistent with that assumption. Uh, the more important reason, however, was again a kind of truism, which wasn't controversial then and isn't controversial now. And that is that free flow of capital undermines democracy and undermines the welfare state. Uh, they were far too uh, popular to ignore in the mid 20th century. Uh, actually, in, if you go back to an earlier period, say, during the period of British domination of the world before World War I, nowhere near as strong as U.S. domination, but substantial. Uh, during that period, as I just mentioned, the level of globalization in gross terms was not very different from today, actually higher in some respects. Uh, capital flow uh, was roughly at today's levels relative to the economy, but uh, in those days, economic policy, state economic policy, could be designed without very much concern for the rabble, because they didn't have a voice. Uh, it was just, you know, voting was restricted and in the industrial societies, you know, kind of very weak imitation of democracy. Therefore, national economic policies could be set and exchange rates could be fixed and so on, uh, even though there was rapid capital flow. And in fact, a major part of current economic policy is to try to get things back to those happy days when you could sort of disregard the population and uh, just leave decisions in the hands of the right people, you know, financial capital and so on. That's a large part of the history of the last 20 or so years. Uh, now, the truism about free capital flow undermining democracy and the welfare state, that was emphasized quite explicitly by the negotiators, the U.S. and British negotiators at Bretton Woods. And the reasoning is straightforward. Uh, capital controls, that is, restrictions on free movement of capital across borders, uh, they enable governments to carry out fiscal policies like monetary and tax policies uh, that are, from the point of view of investors, irrational. That is, they only help people, not profits. So they sustain employment or sustain incomes and social programs and so on. And such policies can be introduced uh, without fear of capital flight uh, if it's constrained. Uh, on the other hand, if there is free flow of capital, you get what some international economists have called a virtual senate uh, of financial capital. It can impose its own social policies simply by the threat of capital flight, you know, sending the capital out of the country, which leads to higher interest rates and uh, uh, economic slowdown, uh, budget cuts for health and education and so on, and recession or maybe collapse. Basically, the IMF principles, if prescriptions, if you look at them. Well, as I say, all of this was articulated very clearly at the time by the U.S.-British negotiators, and it's not particularly controversial then or now. If you have free, flight of free flow of capital, you're going to get a virtual sen a Senate uh, and democracy and 
you know, the welfare, the social contract will be undermined. Very, it's important to keep these really pretty elementary observations in mind when you look at the current period. Well, the Bretton Woods system, as originally established, uh, was pretty much in place um, in, for about 20, 20, 25 years or so. That's what's often called the golden age of post-war state capitalism. Had, by historical standards, high, uh, good economic performance, so high, high rates of growth, um, both of the economy and of production, expansion of the social contract, and so on. Uh, this was dismantled. The system was dismantled from the early 1970s. Uh, one major move was when Nixon simply unilaterally abrogated some of the basic principles. The other major financial centers joined in. Uh, by the 1980s, capital controls were mostly gone uh, in the rich countries, completely gone. The smaller economies held, up, held on to them. South Korea, for example, which is a significant economy, kept them through the 80s. It was compelled to drop them in the early 90s. Uh, that's widely regarded as a major factor in the recent collapse, uh, along with radical failures in the private sector throughout East and Southeast Asia. Big topic. Uh, I should say, I, don't, can't go in, I won't go into it, but I ought to say that uh, serious analysts, at least, uh, uh, consider the East Asia, East and Southeast Asia are quite different, but the East Asian economic miracle is considered quite real. Uh, uh, so, chief economist of the World Bank, Joseph Stiglitz, highly regarded economist, he's in the after the crisis, he's emphasized that the East Asian economic miracle, as he calls it, was, in his words, an amazing achievement, uh, historically without precedent. Uh, he also points out that it was based on quite significant departures from official doctrines, uh, and that it ought to be sustainable unless it's destroyed by financial markets. Uh, he, well, let me quote him, uh, he points out that in the East Asian countries, uh, South Korea and Taiwan, government, as in Japan, uh, government took major responsibility for promotion of economic growth, abandoning what he calls the religion that markets know best in intervening to enhance technology transfer, uh, relative equality, uh, education, health, uh, along, he doesn't say this, but along with industrial policy coordination and strict capital controls. Uh, he also mentions that the rich countries had followed somewhat similar paths, as the World Bank has also acknowledged, but nowhere near accurately. And in fact, that's the basis for economic development historically and in every case that we know. Uh, well, what happened after the Bretton Woods system collapsed uh, in the uh, early 70s? Essentially, the golden age ended. Uh, since then, it's been a period of uh, much uh, poorer uh, economic performance. Again, you can argue about causal effects, but the facts are not controversial. There's been a slowdown, especially in the industrial world. I mean, let's keep to the industrial world, the Western industrial world, it, you know, a little variation from place to place, but essentially there's been a slowdown of uh, growth both of the economy and of productivity, that's noticeable. Uh, also trade, if you look more closely, uh, it's a lot of claims about an explosion of trade and there's a few instances where it's correct, but overall it's not. Trade seems to be going up uh, relative to the general economy, but that's because the economy has been going down faster than the rate of growth of trade has been going down, so the ratio is higher. Uh, the, uh, that's one major effect poor economic performance. Uh, secondly, particularly in the United States and England, but to some extent in the general industrial world, uh, incomes have stagnated or declined for the great majority of the population. In the United States, working conditions uh, have gotten a lot worse. Uh, social services, as you know, have deteriorated. Uh, infrastructures collapsed. There's huge debt. Uh, the welfare state is kind of in tatters sort of what would be expected from the decisions of the virtual Senate. Uh, in the United States uh, and in England, inequality has, which was declining from, during the golden age, uh, it's rapidly increased. It's now back to roughly what it was in the 1920s. Uh, that all of these effects leave a kind of superfluous population who 
aren't very, you know, don't contribute much to profit formation. In third world dependencies, you carry out things like what's called social cleansing in Colombia, like you kill them or something like that. Uh, but this is a civilized society, so we treat them differently. We throw them in jail. Uh, and the rate of incarceration has been going up very rapidly, uh, right along with these policies. It's sort of made easier by race, class correlations, and so on. Uh, but the basic phenomenon is nothing much to do with them. Uh, so throw them in jail. Uh, around 1980, this has nothing to do with crime rates, incidentally. U.S. crime rates are sort of toward the high end of the rich countries, but not off the spectrum. There is one exception, namely killing with guns, but that has to do with the gun culture and the gun laws, not uh, crime rates. Uh, the, uh, and, and as you'd expect, in around 1980, the United States was within the spectrum, sort of toward the high end, in incarceration of the population. Uh, that tripled during the 1980s. It's still going up very fast. Uh, it's now five to ten times as high as any other industrial society, and it's long been a world record among any societies that have meaningful statistics. Uh, the, uh, and it's not insubstantial. So, for example, the numbers in prison, the numbers of working-age people in prison, uh, would, if you counted them, that would add about 2% to the unemployment rate, which is no small amount. Uh, there's also a big prison industry developing and, uh, you know, it's becoming a major private boondoggle even for big military industry and so on. A lot of money involved. Well, that's, these are other changes. Another change is that particularly in the 1990s, uh, profits uh, went through the roof. Uh, the business press has been just ecstatic through the 90s. Actually, this is up until the middle of this year. You know, things changed around August. Uh, but up until then, the business press was absolutely ecstatic, uh, you know, stupendous, uh, dazzling. They couldn't find words for it. Uh, uh, a major change around 1970, that early 70s, was an astronomical increase in capital flows that came from the deregulation. Uh, and mostly short term, very short term, like around 80% of it, is uh, a week or less, you know, means comes back to where it started within a week, often days or hours. Uh, the amounts are now huge, nobody really knows, but it's estimated about a trillion and a half dollars a day or something of that sort. It's virtually unrelated to the real economy, probably harmful to it. Uh, back in 1970, when the total was far smaller, about 90% of foreign exchanges were estimated to be concerned with the real economy, meaning like investment and trade, 10% speculative. Uh, by now, general guesses are around maybe 5% related to the real economy. The rest, speculative and very short term, with the effects you'd expect. Uh, it, there's, uh, it's well known, those of you who uh, it's well known in the economics literature that there's basically no theory for financial markets. Uh, they're governed, standard terminology is, by panics, manias, and crashes. There's a lot of irrational herd behavior. Uh, it's what's called technical trading or noise trading, you know, not related to economic fundamentals, but just like, you know, guesses as to how to make money in three seconds and so on. Uh, it leads to, there has been much more volatility of markets since the early 1970s, uh, a lot of panics, manias, and crashes, unpredictable and never predicted, uh, bigger and bigger every time they come around. Nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and they, the honest people admit it. Uh, recently, the, the Bank for International Settlements, which is, I guess, ranks as the most conservative institution around. It's the central bank of central bankers. Uh, they recently came out with their latest report in which they said, look, we don't know what's going on, and they urged humility uh, in the face of uh, uh, the turmoil in the world. As I said, it's now becoming a crisis because rich people are getting worried instead of the usual victims. Uh, the IMF did a study of uh, banking crises from 1980 to 1995, that 15-year period, uh, and they found that about uh, a fifth of the country, that's almost every country in the world, around 180 countries, uh, one-fifth of them had serious banking crises and another 60% and another had significant problems, often recurrent problems, a lot of bailouts and, you know, again, 
very volatile and irrational markets and rapid, very rapid fluctuations of exchange rates in response to speculative flows. Uh, all of that means everything's out of hand. Uh, and now, as I say, it's worrying rich people. Uh, the, uh, uh, another feature of this period, since around 1970, uh, has been an attack on free markets. That's not what you read, but that's what's been happening. Uh, the words of, let me just, the head of economic current, head of economic research of the World Trade Organization did a technical monograph on this a couple of years ago. Uh, he described this period as one of what he called sustained assault on free markets uh, led by the Reagan administration. Uh, he estimated uh, Reaganite protectionist measures, which were extreme, at about three times those of other industrial countries in their effects. Uh, these are often not tariffs. They're what are called non-tariff barriers, just various other devices which essentially block trade and are intended to do that. Uh, during the Reagan years, which was, ex I mean, the Reagan period is called conservative. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. It was an extreme radical statist administration. Uh, the ratio of state expenditures to gross national product shot up, the you know, debt shot up, and uh, protectionism also increased. It approximately doubled during the Reagan years broke post-war records. Public subsidies increased enormously. There were bailouts, uh, trans transfers to the public sector, in effect. Uh, it was, there was reasons for it. The reason was, uh, go back to around 1980, you'll notice there was a lot of concern about the industrial decline, about the decline of the American economy. And there were calls for what was called reindustrialization of America. Uh, and in order to carry out the reindustrial re Real reindustrialization of America, the Reagan administration turned to the classic device, uh, government spending, in particular Pentagon spending, uh, which since the Second World War has been the absolute foundation of the economy. Uh, every dynamic sector of the economy, sort of virtually every one, flows off it. Some extreme examples, like a current example is the internet, but computers, electronics, uh, you pick it, uh, largely initiated and subsidized through by the public, uh, then handed over to private capital. Uh, and the Pentagon has been a favored device for doing this. One reason why the Pentagon budget stays high, independently of any conflict, and why it's strongly supported, in fact increased by people like Gingrich and Lott and others who parade as conservatives. Uh, can, in other words, all this market discipline is fine for poor people, but not for rich folk. Uh, they have to keep the cycle of dependency going. Well, in 1980, it was a big problem. Uh, uh, they had to reindustrialize America. They turned to the Pentagon, uh, as, and there was a huge increase in the Pentagon budget. Uh, it, it was pretty explicit what it was about. Uh, so, for example, the Pentagon picked up, uh, developed a program, manufacturing technology program, Mantech it was called, uh, which was going to overcome the failures of American management. American management had failed to keep up with uh, modern management techniques that had been pioneered largely by the Japanese, you know, lean production and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so they had to be given a shot in the arm. Uh, the Pentagon devised this program uh, to design what they called the factory of the future with uh, automation and flexible production, lean production, and all this kind of stuff. And the purpose was straightforward. It was, in their words, to boost the market share and industrial leadership of American industry, which had fallen way behind because of management incompetence. Uh, the same is true of the national laboratories, so the DOE labs, the Department of Energy labs. Uh, their explicit goal is, to, in their words, to move federally developed technologies into private in industry and academia. Uh, academia is just one of the funnels by which public funds go into private pockets. Uh, I owe my job to it. I shouldn't complain too much. MIT is a large part of this. Uh, but uh, that's the purpose of the, of the government labs. And the reindustrialization work. The, the idea was to overcome management failures, to save central components of the economy, the whole industrial system, from mainly Japanese competition, uh, and also to put them in a position to dominate the emerging technologies and markets uh, 
of the future. Again, as I say, the Internet is a, and information technology generally are good examples. The Internet, for example, was designed for about 30 years, mostly, in the public sector, first by the Pentagon and the National Science Foundation. Uh, it was finally commercialized over the opposition of about two-thirds of the population. Uh, but uh, that was just a few years ago, 1995, in fact. Uh, to the extent that there had been some private involvement, but if you check it back, it's usually federally funded. Initiative came out of the Information Processing Technology Office of the Pentagon for the most part uh, the, uh, since the 60s, but that's only one example. Well, all of that's continuing under Clinton, uh, including radical interference with free trade when it's convenient. And that runs across the spectrum of choices. So the Clinton administration has, in one way or another, barred everything from you know, things ranging from Mexican tomatoes uh, openly because U.S. consumers preferred them to Florida-grown ones. They said so. That's at one end. The other end, Japanese supercomputers, uh, which were blocked by prohibitive tariffs pretty recently uh, for the open purpose of protecting U.S. manufacturers like Cray Enterprise, which is main, had been the main U.S. manufacturer of supercomputers. It's called private enterprise, but only because the profits are private. Uh, the um, markets are government under Buy America programs and things like that. Uh, much of the technology and the uh, funding has been public, uh, but uh, the profits are indeed profits are indeed private, and when they couldn't manage, just slammed high tariffs on them. Uh, so that goes on, and that's an old story. That's the hist a good part of the history of industrial development uh, uh, from, actually, for Britain as well, before us. It goes to the United States, goes back to the early 1820s. Well, in the recent years, the mid-90s, there's been a lot of euphoria in the United States, again, up till about August of this year. It's a switch point. But up till then, there's been a great deal of euphoria uh, about you know what's called the fairy tale economy. So you could read front page headlines in the New York Times about saying that Americans were smug and prosperous and the happy glow of the uh, uh, American boom and a fat and happy America is enjoying one of the greatest booms in American history and on and on. If you read through these euphoric accounts, they always give one example. Uh, that's the stock market. Uh, and it's true, the stock market has been an absolute fairy tale, especially for the top 1% of American households who own close to half the stock uh, and other assets, and the top 10% who own most of the rest. Uh, what happens when you go down to the next 10%, you know, the next decile from 80 to 90% of income? Well, it turns out that their net worth has declined in the 1990s. Uh, meaning their debts increased faster than uh, their assets. Uh, and as you go down below the next 10 percent, down to the bottom, and the story just gets worse and worse, uh, 80 percent approximately of families are working a lot more hours on their worst conditions just to keep from losing more ground. Uh, the, they haven't yet recovered the level of, the, of 1989, according to the latest statistics, let alone early 1970s when the great economic boom began to take off. Uh, all of this is without precedent in American history. This is a recovery from recession, and it's the rec first recovery uh, in which uh, most of the population was basically left out, you know, trying to get back to where they were uh, before the boom. Uh, as for growth, you know, economic growth and so on, this uh, greatest boom in American history is, in fact, one of the worst. It's the worst in the post-war period. Uh, it's the slowest. It's below e economic growth is below even the quite anemic 70s and the 80s, way below the 50s and the 60s. Uh, it's, uh, it's great. It's a fairy tale for some people, undoubtedly. And those happen to be the ones who are writing the articles about it and the ones they meet in elegant restaurants and the right parties and so on and so forth. So yeah, for them it's a fairy tale economy. Uh, you do get, uh, there's studies of consumer, you know, of uh, op consumer optimism, that sort of thing. They've been running pretty high uh, 
But look a little more closely and you'll discover that the main reason is that people, as the researchers point out, have lowered their expectations. Uh, so now if you can get by, that's enough. You know, then you're happy. You don't expect your children to do much better. Maybe they'll do worse. That's a change. It's a new change in American history. Well, that's the fairy tale economy. Uh, and the reasons for the fairy tale are also pretty frankly explained. And we should listen to the explanations. So maybe the most uh, powerful and most respected person in the United States is the Fed chair, Alan Greenspan. And he's explained, uh, he's very proud of the economy that he presided over. Uh, and he explained how it works to Congress in his congressional testimony. He attributed the fairy tale to what he called uh, greater worker insecurity, uh, meaning workers are intimidated. You know, they're afraid to ask for uh, wage for raises and wages because they can just be fired or their jobs can be transferred to Mexico or something like that. Uh, the Clinton administration agreed at the uh, economic report of the president, attributed the economy, fairy tale economy, again, they're very proud of it, to what they called significant wage restraint. Yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, greater worker insecurity. Uh, workers are too intimidated to ask for a share in the good times. Uh, the uh, it's reported in the business press, so Business Week had a study a couple of months ago showing that uh, about 90% of working people are uh, insecure, and that's good for the health of the economy. Any of you who study economics know that. There's a phenomenon called health of the economy, which has absolutely nothing to do with health of the population, I mean, even in the technical sense. Uh, and the health of the economy is improved if people are scared and wages are down, and you don't have to waste money on irrational things like what's good for the general population. It uh, keeps inflation low enough to please financial institutions uh, and uh, concentrates wealth where it ought to be, top few percent. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons for that. The uh, threat of job transfers is one. Uh, that's one of the main purposes of the so-called trade agreements, and there's many others. Uh, I We'll skip further discussion about this because I'm going on too long. Uh, for a while, it looked as if this whole story was going to work. Uh, there were, it looked as if uh, this fairy tale uh, for the top few would work out and that it would be possible to maintain the uh, fraud about the uh, markets knowing best and so on and so forth while calling on plenty of massive state intervention. Uh, to ensure that the rich don't have to face market discipline. Uh, where that was all moving along rather nicely until about last summer uh, when, again, the threat started to reach the people who matter. Uh, since then, it's been, there's been a remarkable change in economic orthodoxy. It, it does change very quickly, very fast. If you look over the years, so it's always flipping up and back. It's a very flexible science, it turns out. Uh, now the orthodoxy has changed. There are calls for capital controls from pretty surprising places, like the Bank for International Settlements, uh, the Business Press, the uh, World Bank. In one form or another, there's debates about it. Uh, even inside the IMF, the last bastion, there's concern about it now. And also some of the most passionate academic advocates of free trade, one of them a well-known Columbia University professor Jagdish Bhagwati has been writing angry articles all over the place. He's one of the most prominent free trade advocates in the profession, in, the, in foreign affairs and so on, condemning what he calls the Wall Street Treasury complex, which is destroying the international economy uh, by imposing policies that free financial markets, I'm quoting him, through the IMF and so on. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's change. Uh, and I think the change can be dated, at least, and maybe attributed, at least plausibly attributed, to the change in the victims. Uh, up until now, it's been mostly poor people. The majority of the population in countries like the United States, the third world, has been completely devastated by this. Uh, but sectors have been left out, the people who count, and now they're worried. They're worried that the whole system will lead to a kind of global meltdown. Well, how to 
uh, there's a reason why they're calling for humility. Uh, they don't know how to tame the destructive forces that have been unleashed. Uh, there have been some proposals. They look reasonable. They've been advanced by leading economists for 20 years or so. They're now sort of coming out of the, you know, they're now sort of moving into public discussion. They might work. They might not. Uh, they've been kept off the agenda of the powerful because they liked the way things were going. They liked those outcomes. Now, maybe not. Well, is this so-called globalized economy really out of control? Uh, that's, as I said, the call for humility is a good idea, but still, given what we know, it's pretty hard to believe. Uh, as I mentioned, in gross terms, it's not all that new. I mean, there are novelties, but uh, by gross measures, it's kind of like pre-World War I. Uh, and most of the interactions, most of the interchanges, are within uh, the major industrial societies, what's sometimes called the triad, you know, Europe, Europe, European Union, you know, North America, and Japan. Well, those are all countries where you can institute, where the public, in fact, could act to institute economic policy changes. These are countries where you can have public policy decisions. There aren't going to be any military coups, for example. I mean, it's not like third world country. Uh, it's, uh, 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 that means an, even within the framework of existing institutions, there are plenty of things you can think of that could well be enacted to uh, uh, restore sort of you know, what's called golden age type structures. And there's no reason to stop there. I mean, the institutions are not self-legitimizing. They never have been in history. They're still not. Uh, they, have to re they have to be challenged, uh, justified. And if they can't be justified, which I think they can't, uh, they can be changed. That's all subject to uh, popular will with very few constraints in the rich industrial countries. Uh, of course, it's completely natural for uh, all the doctrinal institutions uh, to try to make you feel hopeless, to, you know, to divert public attention uh, away from the crucial issues uh, and try to bring about a mood of sort of hopelessness and despair and you know, turn people to individual survival strategies and so on. And if you were working for a PR agency, nobody would have to tell you that that's what you have to do. It's obvious that that's what you have to do. It's been going on for centuries. Uh, it's understandable. Uh, and as always, understanding can uh, liberate people. Uh, it can liberate them to design and uh, follow uh, very different paths. And these could go quite far. Uh, they uh, could go to the dismantling of oppressive, illegitimate institutions, uh, new democratic, more democratic institutional arrangements. Uh, you can write through the economy. It's sort of obvious where to look, but there are plenty of others. Uh, and in fact, it may, we ought to be thinking about somehow trying to make it possible, should be within our reach, uh, to address in some serious way the uh, needless suffering and injustice that are that really define contemporary society uh, and uh, to demonstrate that the human species uh, is not some kind of lethal mutation uh, which is uh, destined to uh, destroy itself and a good deal more uh, in what amounts to the flick of an eye from an evolutionary point of view. That's actually not an unlikely prospect if things continue on the, uh, in the present, the prevailing uh, conditions of social life. Okay, I'll stop there. have some lights and we'll have not that light <laughs> and we'll have two mics down the front so very good uh, so come down and put your questions keep keep your questions uh, short and bear in mind please that your, your questions and comments uh, bear in mind that we have interpreters here so uh, keep them clear <laughs> 
can just about see the mics. Somebody over there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Working? No? How about that one? That one it's, work, it's working. It's working? Now. Okay, go ahead. Um, in your opinion, what is the year 2000 computer crisis and what effect will this have on the world order? as you've described it. I'm no big specialist on this, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who can give more competent answers than I can, but uh, there's no doubt that it's pretty serious. Uh, so, for example, the uh, uh, U.S. security officials are very concerned about it, uh, for one reason, because they're afraid that the uh, air defense systems will collapse in the Soviet Union and China, where they haven't even started to address these questions yet. And uh, the way what are called air defense systems work, uh, they can shoot off missiles, uh, you know, with very little <laughs> you know, kind of hair trigger. Uh, in fact, the U.S. has actually offered China and Russia new air defense systems uh, to try to make sure that they don't you know, by accident, uh, happen to destroy the world. Uh, that's one problem, but there are plenty of others. I mean, the, uh, I mean, I imagine that the, you know, the big banks and so on have probably made sure their interests are cared for, but uh, a lot of other problems around. But nobody really knows. As far as I can tell, nobody basically knows. Uh, it could be, you know, the main advice people are getting is, stay in your homes for the first week or two of the year 2000, don't take any trips, you know, uh, store up on food beforehand and see how things kind of even out. I, I don't know. I mean, and I've never, haven't read anything that seems to know. <laughs> Is that one working? I don't think it. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted you to comment briefly on the uh, you talked a lot about the institutional economic order, and I was interested in your feelings on the currently ongoing high-level discussions on the multilateral agreement on investment and the obvious lack of public discourse. Mm. Actually, I've, I've written a lot about that, if you're interested, so it's in print. I actually did a review. The, the multilateral agreement on investments, which, you, it, which incidentally is for the moment dead, the, uh, it was, uh, this is an... Uh, well, sort of the nature of it was captured rather nicely in a Business Week headline last February. It called it the uh, the explosive trade deal you've never heard of. Uh, both parts of which were true. It's an explosive deal, not really a trade deal. It's an in explosive investor rights agreement, which gives investors extraordinary rights, like nothing, you know, the most extreme that have ever been imagined. Uh, with no obligations. I mean, all the huge treaty, you know, 150 pages, all the obligations are on what they call states, which means people, you know. The state is, is sometimes the state's a dictatorship, sometimes it's marginally or more or less democratic. Uh, but the obligations are all on people and they're in public institutions. And the rights are all for private power, unaccountable private power, and the rights are pretty extraordinary. I mean, corporations had been given the rights of persons, which is outlandish, early in this century, something which scandalized classical liberals, I should say. But uh, that has already happened, although it could be and I think should be rescinded because it's outlandish. But this treaty, like parts of NAFTA, actually gives them the rights of states, uh, which is something novel. Uh, and the, the, you know, no time to go into it. Anyhow, it's been going on. It was initially, originally they tried to, they thought they'd put it through the World Trade Organization, but that didn't work because there was a lot of objection from third world countries, uh, India and Malaysia, so it shifted over to the OECD, uh, the rich countries, you know, 29 richest countries that's more controlled. And it went on for about three years, the negotiations, with virtually no public comment. I did a almost complete review in the United States and England and Australia. Uh, and until the one, uh, until early this year, that's after close to three years, there was like statistical error, you know, uh, occasional art mention here and there. It's not that it was unknown, it was perfectly well known. Uh, so the business press, n the business world knew all about it, their lobbying groups were involved in it from the beginning, the, you know, 
must have known. Uh, but it was kept, uh, it's one of those inconvenient facts that was kept dark, to borrow Orwell's phrase. The one partial exception was Canada. In Canada, in early mid 1997, it sort of broke through because of popular activism. Uh, and, and that led to a lot of pressure uh, and a lot of publicity, you know, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and so on. Uh, in the rest of the industrial world, it sort of began to break through, mostly from public activism early this year. Uh, and the, the signing date was supposed to be last April, but they backed off uh, in near panic. The OECD, there were some quite comical articles about it. The London Financial Times, which is, you know, the premier business daily in the world, uh, had an article called Hordes of Vigilantes. Uh, and it was about the hordes of vigilantes who overwhelmed the OECD and the corporations and the, you know, the rich countries and the transnational and the international financial institutions. This horde of vigilantes, which a lot of activists, uh, just overwhelmed them and frightened them and they had to back off from trying to do it. And they quoted people who warned that it may not be as easy as it has been in the past to uh, uh, arrange international agreement uh, in secret and then have them rubber stamped by parliaments. That's the way it's been working until now, but now we may be in trouble because all those vigilantes are around, the trade unionists, environmentalists, you know, grassroots activists and so on. It's another crisis of democracy and in fact a pretty stunning victory for the vigilantes if you look at the forces that were arrayed against each other. Uh, well, they tried to put it off until October, uh, last October, uh, but it collapsed. I mean, by that time, a couple of major countries had pulled out. France pulled out, Australia pulled out, uh, the United States kind of mixed. Uh, and for the moment, at least, it's on the shelf, uh, which means that they're going to sne sneak it in some other way. The major effort of the United States has been to try to push it through the IMF rules by revising the IMF articles to include conditionalities that include a lot of the multilateral agreement. The IMF is properly secret. You know, so it never gets reported, uh, and it, in fact operates in secret. So that's a better forum. Uh, but uh, people are interested; ought to keep their eyes on it. Do you think the recent failure in Paris could be at all attributed to to the uh, what you talked about going on in the stock market in partly. August? Yeah, partly. I mean, partly just the uh, power centers are scared, uh, but partly, and I think we shouldn't underlook, underestimate this. This horde of vigilantes really made a difference. Uh, the same happened last fall, uh, with a year ago, that is, with Fast Track. Uh, up until, as the Clinton administration argued correctly, Fast Track had been standard legislation. Incidentally, this Fast Track issue doesn't really have anything to do with free trade. I mean, even if you put aside the fact that the so-called trade agreements aren't free trade by any, in any meaningful sense, uh, the Fast Track uh, issue has to do with democracy. So even the most passionate advocate of free trade would be in favor of, would be against fast track if they also believed in democracy. I mean, fast track is just an arrangement which allows exactly what I quoted. It allows deals to be made behind closed doors and rubber stamped by parliament. That's fast track. It's got nothing to do with free trade. Uh, but, and in fact, it had always been accepted, I think for about 20 years with a brief gap. Uh, but last fall, when the Clinton administration tried to push it through with like 100% media support, as far as I know, enormous corporate backing, they had to back off, mainly by constituent pressure. So, you know, people were banging on the doors of uh, their congressional representatives, and they backed off, even if they were in favor of it, it never came up. Uh, well, those are all indications of how much can be done, even by extremely disorganized uh, groups with no unity and, you know, very little interaction and, you know, scattered all over the place. Just imagine what could be done by really organized popular movements. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the, indo the doctrinal system has to, you know, the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, the, quote, the Trilateral Commission, they've got to work overtime to do their job, make sure that people don't have these uh, uh, you know, bad thoughts and worry about inconvenient facts. Uh, but uh, these are victories that should be recognized. I mean, they're kind of defensive victories. They didn't, you know, they prevented something. But they're a signal that you can go on to more substantial ones.
What do you think of direct democracy? Well, it depends what you mean by it. Well, it <coughs> I mean, if you mean by it, for example, that, say... As contrasted with representative democracy. Well, it depends. I mean, a any complicated society is going to have to have some kind of representation, I think. I think that's undoubted. Uh, the question is how it works. Well, uh, you, you, your remarks indicated you're dissatisfied with the way power is acquired and wielded in this country. And but that has nothing to do with the... You ended by suggesting that perhaps it's time for some new ideas. Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with... I mean, one, it, of them, one of them is that everybody votes on yeah, plebiscites it's, it's, and referenda. It's more, or less, more or less irrelevant. Uh, and it's irrelevant because that's one of the ways in which the doctrinal system diverts your attention from what really matters. Uh, what really matters is the fact that uh, the major institutions in the society are under totalitarian control. After all, what's a corporation? You know, a, a corporation is just a tyrannical system, one of the most tyrannical systems that humans have ever devised. It, they've been given extraordinary rights by the courts, not by legislation, early in this century. Uh, they're, like the multilateral agreement, would give them actually the rights of states. They're basically unaccountable to the public. Uh, when they've been given the rights of persons, that means, for example, they have the right to propagandize. So, like, they've been given the rights of free speech, which is insane. You know, these are collectivist institutions. Uh, they've been given the right to advertise, in fact, at your expense. So you get the tax-free. So you get, you pay for the privilege of having your minds destroyed. Uh, and uh, uh, they, you know, they, um, you know, they own the information system. I mean, they control the information system. That, what are the media? You know, huge corporations, parts of bigger corporations. That sets the framework of discussion. discussion it, the major decisions that affect what happens in the economy and social life are made behind closed doors. Very little public accountability. They have the right of freedom from search and seizure. You know, Fourth Amendment rights means you can't know anything about what they're doing. You know, uh, and uh, uh, and they have enormous power. Uh, furthermore. I mean, it's described as free trade, but it's ridiculous. I mean, these, about maybe nobody, these are secret institutions, so all figures have to be taken with a big grain of salt because nobody really knows. Uh, but the guesses are that by international economists that maybe 40% or so of U.S. trade is actually internal to corporations, meaning it's not trade at all. You know, it's just moving something across a border. It's no more trade than moving from Indiana to Illinois or something like that. It happens across a border, you know, to get cheaper labor, to avoid environmental restrictions and so on. Well, you know, 40% is not a small number. And that's a vast underestimate because there are also complicated strategic alliances among alleged competitors. So IBM and Toshiba and Siemens and so on are working together. You know, they're working together on design, on marketing and so on. Uh, and in fact, uh, in fact, it's gotten to the point where some international economists call it a new system of what they call alliance capitalism. You know, big networks of tyrannical institutions basically running the world. I mean, in comparison with this, the difference between, you know, everybody voting and everybody not voting is pretty trivial. These are the major questions. So you think the public opinion polls are a sham? No, they're not at all a sham. In fact, they're extremely interesting. Uh, and you should pay attention to them. Uh, the, uh, uh, the United States is very, uh, public opinion polls are different from votes, incidentally, totally different. In fact, public opinions and the results of votes often turn out to be radically different. And some of the reasons are given by the fate of referenda. So, for example, take where I live, Massachusetts. Uh, for years, you know, every year there was a referendum on uh, um, progressive income tax for the state. Now, that would benefit, you know overwhelming benefit for the general population. You take a look at the public opinion polls. At the beginning, very strong support for it. And then it slowly declines. And by election day, it's a minority. Why did it decline? Well, huge propaganda campaigns uh, warning people that if you do this, all the business is going to flee out of Massachusetts, you won't have a job, your children will starve, and so on. Yeah, that's just what the guys who own the information system want you to believe. So public opinion, you should look at public opinion polls for the same reason that they are taken. Well, why do we have so many public opinion polls in the United States? Well, they're mostly business or initiated. The propaganda institutions like the PR industry, they want to keep their finger on the public pulse. 
They've got to know how to design the propaganda. So they want to know what people are thinking. So in fact, if you want to find out, you can find out too. Uh, and you can find out how these opinions are changed. Sometimes, sometimes they're very resilient, strikingly resilient. So say, take the Vietnam War. Uh, there was huge propaganda justifying the war. I mean, among articulate people, there was virtually no opposition to it, contrary to what you, you're told. There was pragmatic opposition. You know, it's not working or something like that. Uh, but, you know, there's that kind of opposition in Hitler's general staff after Stalingrad. Uh, <laughs> principled opposition was almost non-existent. This has been studied, incidentally, literally almost non-existent. On the other hand, if you look at public opinion polls, they're quite different. So public opinion studies were taken regularly by the Gallup poll. One of the questions, every you know, regular questions in the Gallup polls from around 1970 to the early 90s, last one I saw, was what do you think of the war in Vietnam, given an open set of choices, you know, like 10 options, where you usually get low numbers. But it was a steady 70%, roughly, you know, plus or minus a little, uh, that chose uh, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. There's nobody in educated opinion, articulate opinion who ever said that. I mean, everybody who answered the question that way was making it up for themselves. Uh, well, you know, that's a, a striking indication of the divergence between public opinion and policy. Actually, another one is the multilateral agreement on investments, which is just mentioned. As soon as it became public, you know, the whole thing collapsed uh, because uh, for exactly the reason that the negotiator said. It looks like an end to an era when we can make deals behind closed doors and have them rubber stamped by Parliament. Uh, there's rabbles getting involved in things. Uh, those are some of the major reasons for, uh, for the kind of thing that Orwell was talking about, for you know, thought controlled and free societies. Uh, in fact, the more you, you know, the less force to the, as people win more freedom, as we people have, you know, meaning that the power to coerce by violence has declined. The importance of propaganda has increased. Uh, and that's well understood. I mean, you can, you know, you read it in manuals of the public relations industry and in the productions of academic intellectuals, you know, the founders of modern political science, uh, public intellectuals and so on. You have to control the public mind because we can't control people in any other way. Well, under those conditions, you know, public opinion polls are important and interesting. Uh, public intellectuals and so on, you have to control the public mind because we can't control people in any other way. Well, under those conditions, you know, public opinion polls are important and interesting, uh, but uh, uh, voting is something different because people are giving st highly structured choices, structured by an information system which is dedicated to maintaining the power of those who own and run it. Uh, and uh, that power is enormous. I mean, the cor corporate control of the media is like a small part of it. Uh, the corporate control of the economy and social life is a far stronger part. The virtual Senate that I mentioned is another part. I mean, unless we think about those institutions uh, worrying, I mean, you know, concern about things like proportional representation or, you know, voting by computer and so on may be of some interest, but it's like 10 third or effect. Noam, you mentioned how uh, geologists have, or their findings are having an impact on the long-term geostrategic impact or interests in uh, the Middle East. I was wondering if you could comment on, on a different type of scientist's impact on the same resource, um, in particular that of climate scientists um, who are now estimating that over the next hundred years we can safely use maybe 40 years of current usage of fossil fuels without having some serious impacts both on on the ecology, but also on a number of human social structures, and what that will, what potential that has for altering the geostrategic balance, and also for being an issue around which people can confront these sources of power that you talk about. Yeah. Incidentally, just to be clear, uh, I'm not suggesting that policymakers or advisors are paying much attention to any of this. Uh, the reason is that they think in extremely short term, uh, in a short term framework. And furthermore, a lot of them are econ professional economists. So if you look at the OECD, you know, the rich countries, they don't, apparently don't even have a major study group on this. Uh, and the ones that they have are mostly staffed by professional economists who, just like the head of the World Bank said, they have a religion. 
and the religion says it can't happen. You know, it can't happen because markets are perfect. You know, so as soon as uh, the price starts to go up, some miracle will happen and people will find an alternative fuel. Well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe not. Nobody knows. Uh, but if you believe in the religion, you don't have to worry about it. Like most religions, there's an answer, you know. Uh, you got it in graduate school. But uh, uh, as far as I know, there is no serious planning going on about this. And the, f the pr professional articles about it say they can't discover any serious planning. Uh, it should be a serious issue, and what U.S. planners are surely concerned about are the visible steps towards realignments in the Middle East region. That they're concerned about. And they certainly are concerned about controlling it. And they are concerned about uh, trying to, in the United States, about trying to... There's a conflict between the United States and Europe over Iran right now. I mean, the Europeans mostly want to reintegrate it into the world system. The United States, for its own reasons, wants to keep it out and punish it. Uh, and uh, that's apparently a good bit of the sort of background for you know, all this talk about where the pipeline ought to go and you know how much oil there is around the Caspian Sea and so on. So that kind of short-term stuff, yeah, people are thinking about, but not, there's no reason to believe that they're thinking about the long-term questions. I think we ought to be thinking about them, but doesn't mean planners are. On the climatologist, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's just a overwhelming consensus that there are big problems coming. Nobody knows what they are. You know, like one of the consequences, uh, the critics, there's like about six scientists in the world or something who are, who take up about half the newsprint, who are regularly trotted out to say, uh, which is true, that the models aren't very good and there are a lot of things you don't understand and so on. So there's a lot of uncertainties. But of course, a point about uncertainty is that, you know, the guesses could be off in either direction. That's one of the elementary properties of uncertainty. So the predictions could be overstating, which is the only thing you ever hear, or they could be understating, which you don't hear. You know. And again, for reasons of short-term gain and profit. Uh, in fact, until the ozone layer started breaking up in the north, you didn't hear anything about that either. You know, as long as it was just people down, you know, down there and somewhere. And the chemical companies had yeah. an alternative to sell. Yeah, yeah. and then they had, they had alternatives. But it really hit the Wall Street Journal and so on when people who count were starting to get affected. Uh, and uh, uh, right now, people who count are, not, are doing pretty well with uh, oil stocks. Uh, the big uh, mergers that are coming along, like Exxon and Mobil, those guys are probably thinking about it. You know, but, that doesn't, but that doesn't mean that planners are. Uh, on the climate issues, the ecological issues, are there. that's sort of what I had in mind in my last statement. It could well turn out that humans will simply quickly be in a lethal mutation. That could happen. Uh, and in fact, as to the consequences of global warming, you can find predictions all over the place. I mean, some of them are that, you know, the sea level will rise in meters and meters, which may happen. But another fairly widely held view is that uh, Europe will move into an ice age uh, because the um, f Gulf Stream will be redirected farther south, which would make Europe something like, you know, Green Greenland or something like that. Uh, and the effects of that on the global, global society are, you know, just incalculable. Another prediction is uh, reasonably widely held is that the Midwest U.S. will become a dust bowl, which would have a terrific effect on uh, global food supplies for bad reasons, because so much of it has been concentrated there. Uh, so, you know, there are all kinds of serious dangers. People ought to be worrying about these things. Yes, um, I wanted to ask you about the possibility of a solution that, as you mentioned, in Latin America, the basic um, other force was the masses, and that's also true about the whole world. Considering that now what the situation is that basically the workers' union in the United States have been demolished for all practical purposes, and that's kind of happening in Europe to them today, and uh, what's happening in the third world, there is no OPEC anymore, and the allied nations don't exist. Basically, most of the progressive forces have been um, attacked and weakened. 
How do you see that? Because from where you are, I'm sure you have a better idea than I have, at least. Um, no, we're all guessing. But the, my, my guesses are a little different. That, do you see that the movements, the little movements here and there, somehow will come together and create a mass movement uh, that can connect internationally? Because that's basically what we need. And being a left person, and um, some of the left ways of doing things have been discredited, but still I believe... Discredited by who? Uh, by the powers to yeah, be. Yeah, by power. And but as such... Did they ever credit them? No, no. And okay. as such... They tell you they're discredited, but that's because they want you to feel helpless. I don't feel that yeah, way, okay, but it fine. does have, yeah. as you said, propaganda on the yeah. masses. So okay, first, to... for, just to back up a yeah. little, I mean, I think you ought to be cautious about describing OPEC as a progressive force. No, no, not progressive, uh, but at anything. least in the... In it like wasn't a, even, in, even an independent force. No, the price of oil or... Yeah, but, you know, no. just take a look at U.S. No, and Britain and their reaction to the rise in oil price. They didn't mind. Uh, in fact, the U.S. and Britain kind of suppress... I mean, Britain is kind of like the little puppy dog. They do what they're told. But the United States... Uh, 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 in fact, you know, you can read professional literature which says, uh, refers to the U.S. Treasury and then has a footnote saying that's shorthand for the U.S.-U.K. Treasury. But uh, they, uh, uh, they were not so much opposed to the oil price rise. And the reason is they sort of benefited from it. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis their main competitors, the uh, other industrial countries. Yes. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the U.S. was actually running a positive trade balance with Saudi Arabia after the price went up because they figured out ways of getting the Arab facade to recycle the profits. Uh, that's why there was such a huge armaments flow to, to the oil producing countries. Mostly comes back here. Uh, and also don't forget that the and construction projects and all sorts of things. Uh, that's where Bechtel got, you know, rich from. Uh, and don't forget that when the oil price goes up, at the pump, the profits go up too. And the profits are mostly US British companies. Uh, so they're perfectly happy to have the price go up. Uh, another effect of the early 70s uh, price rise um, was that it uh, enabled the oil majors to bring online uh, production fields that they knew about, but were not using because they weren't profitable enough. When the price went up high enough, you could start using North Sea oil, which is what saved the Thatcher government from totally destroying England. Uh, and uh, you could bring along Alaska oil, uh, which are, you know, wasting resources. They're not big, uh, but they were around for 20 years or so. And that was there because of the price rise. Uh, so the oil companies were not unhappy about it. Uh, in fact, there was a meeting in, I think, around February 1974 or so, where Kissinger and you know the White House called in uh, rich countries, other, and kind of told them you know laid down the line on this, not to make a fuss about the oil price rise. Uh, and it, in fact, the U.S. and Britain led the way out of the you know short-term global recession then, because uh, they weren't being harmed by it. And if they had been harmed, that our Arab facade would not have stayed in business very long. Uh, you can be sure of that. They would have. You know, they do their job or else they're out. Uh, the, uh, so, I, 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 don't, I mean, you know, there are big problems with energy, but not that. I, I don't, also, I, don't, I wouldn't quite say that the American unions have been destroyed. They certainly have been damaged. Uh, they were damaged seriously by the trade agreements. They were damaged even more by just criminal acts authorized by the, by the government. So the Reagan administration effectively told corporations that they were not going to that they were not going to enforce the laws against uh, illegal firing of union organizers and so on. This is pretty open, actually. It was reviewed in the business press, pretty frankly. They simply said, and the Clinton administration is continuing with that. So the number of firing, firings of workers for attempting to organize started shooting way up. It's all illegal, but it doesn't matter if nobody's enforcing the law. Um, if you have a criminal state, you know, crime pays, you know, uh, very well. And uh, one of the effects of that and threats of transfer and so on, that certainly weakened the labor movement along with other, you know, bigger developments. But it's leveled off and there's a recovery. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a big change in terms of numbers, but it's quite a change in terms of uh, consciousness. Uh, so, you know, talks like, say, this, 
You couldn't give to labor audiences 10 years ago. You can now, easily, you know. Uh, and in fact, they're not militant enough, these talks, uh, because they want to see more, you know. Uh, there's, uh, uh, these things you know, oscillate. In fact, for the first time, I mean, the international, you're right about stressing the importance of international solidarity. That's very important, and there's not much of it. Uh, but re just take a look at American labor. You know, up until quite recently, uh, U.S. labor internationally was like an adjunct to the CIA. You know, they were working hard to undermine unions uh, and undermine democratic regimes and so on. That's no big secret. That's changed. Uh, the people in the international office now are people who are very much attuned to uh, problems, say, of Latin American labor. And in fact, there are some beginnings, you know, they're not huge, but there are some beginnings of cross-border solidarity, uh, anti-sweatshop agitation, you know, pushing, you know, the, this very limited wording in NAFTA, which was put in to silence public opinion about labor rights, but that's being pushed sometimes constructively by American unions, sometimes by Mexican workers, in fact. Uh, and uh, those are good signs. Uh, Europe is a big problem. Uh, in Europe, interaction among the labor unions is apparently, I, I don't know a lot about this, but from what I understand is very slight, you know, different languages and so on and so forth. And that's got to become a more significant factor, especially with the European Union. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me in any ways a lost cause. And all the talk you read about discrediting the left, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, these, these views that they say are discredited are ones they've been screaming, denouncing for all their lives, you know, all through history. Nothing discredited about them. Uh, like mild social democratic policies, they've worked quite well, you know, within limits because they leave private power essentially unassailed. But it's the collapse of these policies that's been devastating. The policies weren't discredited. Uh, the, and uh, they're by no means the limit. They're the beginning. I think there's, and things like what we were talking about before, say the popular, really quite spontaneous popular reaction to things like the MAI, that's rather striking. Uh, that's done with no organization. Uh, and uh, by now, you know, there are structures forming. Uh, they can interact and they can grow. So it doesn't seem to me a terribly depressing prospect. You can worry about the pace. Maybe it's not adequate. Probably isn't. But, you know, the right kinds of things are happening, I think. Good. I didn't want to give the impression that I was depressed or anything. I'm yeah. going on with what yeah. I've been doing for 30 years, but I just wanted to see yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there are things you can be... I mean, if, you know, I mean, optimism and pessimism are kind of like personal. Right. You know, it belongs to... <laughs> it's what you worry. When you're sitting alone somewhere, right. that's what you think about. Otherwise, you just stay optimistic. That's the only way anything will ever happen. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Chomsky, just to let you know ahead of time, this is a critical comment. Um, it sounds as if your work draws a lot on C.W. Mills, Marx, and Emmanuel Wallerstein's thinking. And I'm wondering, um, what's new and exciting about Chomsky in theory? So for us students of the social sciences in the room, uh, what can we take away from this lecture? Yeah. Well, certainly not. Uh, I mean, it's basically, first of all, there's no theory. In fact, I don't know of any theories in the social sciences. I mean, I don't think the term theory should be applied to fields as intellectually thin as the social sciences. Uh, so there's no theory. Uh, there's just some common sense observations. Uh, I started off, if you remember, by saying that views of this kind are commonly described as Marxist, which is kind of ironic because the clearest articulation is people like Adam Smith and Winston Churchill and so on, uh, which is true. Uh, the, so, uh, and I think that most of this is kind of common sense. So if the there's, message, if there's no theory, what's the point then? Oh, the theory is very different from understanding. Uh, most of our lives, are, we live our lives often pretty successfully without any theories about other people. Uh, we don't have any theories about other people, but, you know, we get along and manage our interactions and so on. Uh, there's very few areas of human life where there's anything you might call a theory. Uh, so some areas, of the, like even in biology, you know, it would be, but when you get very far beyond big molecules, I mean, it starts to become pretty descriptive. 
Sure, but there, uh, there's, and in, this, in the world of human affairs, I don't think there's much in the way of theory. I think the message you ought to take is use your, use your sense. Look at history, you know, think of obvious things, you know, break through the propaganda images. Uh, remember that the institutions are trying to indoctrinate you, keep that in mind, compensate for it. Uh, and if you do these things, I think you can get as good a sense of the world as anybody has. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, the ongoing uh, artificial threat of Cuba to the United States. And um, I wonder if you could address a radio program called Marti that we beam as a propaganda and uh, maybe on a larger level the uh, whole apparatus of the international propaganda broadcasting in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, the U.S., like other countries, has a uh, state propaganda system, um, U.S. Information Agency and others. And it's not particularly huge. I mean, this is, you know, by comparative standards, I don't think it's, considering the size and scale of the United States, it's not relatively a huge program. I mean, I don't think states ought to have the right to carry out propaganda, but even more important, I don't think private entities ought to have the right to carry out propaganda. I mean, maybe the individual, the individuals in them can, but not as entities. Private entities? Uh, like the New York Times. Or, um, or General Electric. <laughs> yeah. Or Jorge Mascanosa, who recently died. Who yeah, was he's, he's a person. He should have rights. Uh, people should have rights, I think, independent of what their views are. But whether organic entities should have rights, that's another question. Uh, as I mentioned, when organic entities were given the rights of persons early in this century, that scandalized conservatives, you know, what are called classical liberals, for perfectly obvious reasons. Classical liberal doctrine, what's called conservatism, held that rights inhere in human beings, persons. That means people of flesh and blood, you know, not collectivist entities legal fictions, you know, that were constituted and created and given the rights of persons by courts. I think those are things that we ought to question. Why should they have the rights to freedom from search and seizure, for example, so that you don't know what they're doing? I mean, I think an individual should have it. Like, I don't think that cops should have the right to go into your living room and find out what you're up to. Uh, but what about a, uh, an organic entity? Should that have those rights? I mean, should Nazi Germany have those rights, for example, or Bolshevik Russia? I don't think so. So why General Electric? Thank you. I was very disappointed on your expose, first part, in whose is world power. You, did the you mentioned the Qatar, but you, the you emphasized a few seconds ago about history. I mentioned you, what? You didn't mention at all about Yugoslavia. No, I left I Yugoslavia 40 years ago. I didn't understand West that time why they had me brought to Yugoslavia with Yalta, with Tehran, etc. I'm Serbian by native, a citizen of the United States. I came to the United States in College Park. I won my political freedom in New York, but I lost to my Jewish wife from New York my personal freedom. We have a daughter here who got graduated uh, diploma last summer, intercultural relations. She cannot understand Jewish mother always right or wrong father Serbian. So we polarized our family of three members in the half. Question, my question is, if organization of European states, 37 countries, signed about a quarter of a century ago, uh, non-violation of borders of any states and former Secretary Baker said in June, I do believe 21st June, in Belgrade, I was not for 40 years over there, then border of Yugoslavia is unviolated. That and yet now my adopted country sided with former colonialist country, France, Great Britain, Portugal, Spain, breaking one country to pieces, same people, same language, two different alphabets. Yeah. What about your victim, poor people on third part of the expose, for the economic point of view, for second part about your human rights, we are yeah. always with horns and with with uh, kangaroo tails, demon, satan, yeah. my Serbian people. Yeah, how you can mush it? How you can explain uh, Look, you're, there, how can I explain? Well, first of all, every case has to be explained on its own. You're quite right, I didn't mention Yugoslavia, but you know, I didn't mention 99% of the world. Like, for example, I didn't mention Southern Africa. 
where uh, at the very same time as all the as the Bosnian war was going on there were even more people being killed in Angola uh, and in fact if you go back to the Reagan years uh, under the rubric of what was called constructive engagement uh, US and British backed South African forces uh, killed maybe a million and a half people and caused say 60 billion dollars of damage I didn't mention that either there's a lot of things I didn't mention, you know, but Yugoslavia, yeah, we could look at it, and we sort of, you know, kind of know what happened. Uh, the country was, first of all, was under a, a dictatorship uh, since the 40s, and that dictatorship had many negative aspects, like dictatorships do. It was pretty brutal. On the other hand, it did dampen uh, lots of internal hostilities, kept them down, you know. Uh, the dictatorship collapsed. Part of the reason why it collapsed, in fact, was IMF rules. Uh, so during the 1980s, it's not just the IMF, I mean, during the 1980s, Yugoslavia did go through a kind of structural adjustment program, uh, which had the usual effects that it's had in the third world. Uh, one of the effects that it had was kind of breaking apart the social fabric. That happened alongside the breakdown of the dictatorship uh, when Slovenia and Croatia pulled out, and we don't really know all the details, but as far as is known, it looks as though there was significant German pressure within the European Union to let them break away and facilitate their breakaway, uh, which led, as everyone predicted, to conflict between Serbia and Croatia. Then came, you know, the Bosnian atrocities and ended up uh, with the U.S. moving in after most of the dirty work was done and imposing, part, in effect, partition. Uh, that's, you know, that's more or less what happened. Uh, now the struggle has moved on to Kosovo, which is a very complicated issue. But just to mention one aspect of it, when I said before that uh, the Western powers and Western opinion don't even, you know, give minimal, uh, uh, commit, have no minimal commitment to the basic principles of international order. I mentioned Iraq, but I could have just as well mentioned Kosovo. Uh, NATO, which just means the United States, uh, has no authority to threaten or use force. I mean, this is independent of what you think about what's going on there. You can think whatever you like. Uh, but there is no authorization for the threat of use of force by the United States or anyone else. Uh, there's uh, so, I mean, uh, you're right when you say that uh, the whole international order broke down in Yugoslavia, but it did everywhere else too. I mean, didn't it break down when the United States invaded South Vietnam and then the rest of Indochina and ended up killing four or five but, million people? But Dr. Yeah, Chomsky, is in paradox, What's unifying paradox? 16 different countries with dozen different languages in Europe and breaking one small country to pieces, yeah, then the get paradox? together. From broken glass, you don't drink anymore. Well, I'm sorry, I don't see what the Thank paradox you. is. This is just one of the innumerable problems of international affairs, every one of which has to be looked at on its own. Although you find many of the same factors behind them. A lot of them. Two more? Okay. Boss has two more questions, one on each side. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, uh, my thinking is more uh, from the point of view of uh, India, but you can answer uh, in a more general sense. Uh, uh, I'd like you to comment uh, from the point of view of the so-called third world countries uh, in the face of the globalization. Uh, f for example, if you take democracy, uh, democracy seems to be closely linked with freedom of choice. Uh, but say, if, uh, to take a silly example, uh, if you uh, take, say, uh, 20 cities in India and uh, you expose them to uh, Pepsi or Coke for, say, uh, one month and then take a perfectly democratic referendum, uh, you would find that all of them would support, uh, uh, I mean, that Pepsi should come into India. So uh, it seems so vulnerable to uh, the onslaught of the multinational corporations or globalization. So well, in like, fact, when, you know, when India was sort of pressured, and Indian elites agreed, remember, Indian elites agreed, uh, and, and uh, with the Western pressure to what's called liberalize. Uh, I think the first thing that, uh, the first sector of Indian, the Indian economy that was targeted was advertising. So the first thing that happened is big, mostly New York public relations firms and London public relations firms went in there. Uh, and. Uh, just like you described, you know, carried out huge pressure to try to modify tastes. But that shouldn't really surprise you. I mean, the West has been subjected to that for hundreds of years. 
No, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's why we have a huge public relations industry. It's an enormous industry, which is designed to turn people, I mean, you know, they're not very secret about what they're up to. They want to turn everybody into an atomized consumer who recognizes that life is essentially worthless. You can't control your productive life, you can't control your work life, the only th and you can't talk to anybody else because you have to be isolated and atomized, and you get your gratification by consuming more commodities that you don't want. I mean, that's what uh, television is about, that's what radio is about, that's what nine-tenths of the newspapers are about, uh, and it's been going on quite consciously, you know, My for a hundred years. Okay, now it's hitting India. Yeah, my concern is more about the solutions. The solution uh, is, I think, to uh, the, you strike at the heart of private power. I mean, as long as, uh, as private power has this, as, as long as you have this extraordinary concentration of decision-making power in essentially unaccountable private organic institutions, you're going to have problems. Just like you have problems if uh, you have a Bolshevik state. I mean, India is very striking. I was there, you know, before and after, uh, and it was pretty striking. I mean, the last time I was there was, uh, first time I was there was all, you know, Indian food and this, that, and the other thing. Last time I was there was uh, December, uh, January 1996, I think. I was there for about a week, traveling around the country giving talks. Uh, it happened, you know, it happened to hit a huge snowstorm, so I, the flight took around 48 hours. Uh, and uh, I had, Turned out I had to give the first talk at the Delhi School of Economics uh, right uh, like two hours after I landed, you know, after not having slept for a couple of days. Uh, so I asked for some food, you know, something to eat. You know what they brought? McDonald's. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay. You know, you know, I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling introduction to the new India. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, my concern is that how do you do well what do you do I mean, india can defend itself i mean for example the indian media which are not you know great uh, exemplars of democracy you know they're privately owned rich people and so on but they defended themselves against public takeover i mean murdoch and others wanted to take them over and they just resisted uh india has somewhat resisted the uh, international patent regime it's kind of, that's an interesting story. Uh, the United States claims to be in favor of free trade, but really isn't. Nobody is. Nobody powerful is, at least, except for somebody else. Uh, but uh, uh, one of, if you, if you look at the World Trade Organization, one of the founding doctrines of it is radically protectionist. Uh, that's uh, what's called intellectual property rights. Uh, they extended intellectual property rights, like patents, for drugs, you know, to an absolutely unprecedented extent, uh, and also extended them from processes to products. Products were never patented before, just processes. That's not only an attack on free trade, it's also an attack against innovation. It means that some smart guy in India can't figure out a smarter way to uh, produce some drug. Uh, the purpose of this is a major assault on free trade and on innovation and growth in order to ensure the profits of things like Merck Pharmaceutical. Uh, well, you know, India resisted. So the, well, you know better than I do, so fill me in if I don't have the de details right. But the Indi there was so much public opposition that the Indian parliament couldn't ratify it. I think the government went over their heads, if I recall correctly, and ratified yeah, it anyway. They're still so, trying to... Yeah, and by now it's kind of interesting, but the pharmaceutical, it, India had very cheap, relatively cheap drugs because they had their own pharmaceutical industry. It's like as compared with Pakistan, which had international companies, the Indian prices were much lower. Uh, and of course, the purpose of all of this stuff is to make the prices go up. You know. uh, at first, the Indian pharmaceutical firms objected, but I noticed that now they're not objecting, which suggests, maybe you know the answer, but suggests to me that they're probably linking up with the Western pharmaceutical firms so they can just exploit the Indians more efficiently, all of them together. I guess. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, but, yeah, these are... But the point of all of this is that India can resist. So, for example, India maintains some kind of capital controls. In fact, it's kind of striking. If you look at Asia, there's an Asian crisis, but there are a few islands uh, which haven't been much affected. India is one, China's another, Taiwan is another. Uh, they all have some degree of capital controls. I and mean, it's been noted in the professional literature. 
So India was able to resist that kind of liberalization. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you talk about India, it's kind of misleading because there are sectors in India, the wealthy sectors, the professionals and so on, who like the globalization. But look, there were sectors in India who loved the Raj. You know, they enriched themselves. They were the counterpart to the Arab facade. You know, you go to any third world country you want, you know, the poorest one in Central Africa, you'll find a sector of very wealthy people, very privileged, very wealthy people who are kind of linked up mostly with Western power, uh, like the people who ran India for the British. And the, the British didn't run it. They ran it through an Indian civil service and, in fact, Indian troops. And about 90% of the British army was the Indian troops. You know. Well, you know, those guys do fine. You know, they now are in favor of this kind of liberalization. The population may suffer, but that's a different story. Thank you. Last. Uh, I read this interview with you, and uh, I think someone, I think it was Marty Peretz, said that you were outside the pale of intellectual responsibility. I was wondering, I uh, <laughs> what, was, right. what was the context of that, and also, how do you respond? Same way everybody else is responding. <laughs> I mean, as he defines intellectual responsibility, that's absolutely right. For example, I don't have a slavish, Stalinist-like loyalty to his holy state. You know? Okay, that puts me out of the pale of responsibility right off. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then also, I met this guy who said that your last name is Chomsky because your dad spelled it with a chet. Is that true? Uh, that's what the guys at Ellis Island Immigration decided, yeah. I mean, actually, as you know, and from East, they were Eastern European immigrants. They didn't have last names. So my father was... I'll tell you if you like, but it was so-and-so, son of so-and-so. And somewhere along the line, probably at Ellis Island, they got this name, which my father did pronounce with a ch. And in fact, I went through early years of schooling that way until I finally realized that, you know, I'm being put with the H's or the something. Uh, so I just changed the pronunciation, just for convenience. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>